Thanks, Craig, for the introduction. So um, I thought I would talk a little bit, take a step back and look at how far the community has come over the past 10 years and look at some of the improvements and some of the progress we've made. Well, there's still a lot to do, as you're going to see. But uh, also, I want to ap apologize for all the ice sheet modelers in, in the room. Uh, because this has been, you know, mostly centered around what I have been working on, and there's been a lot of work done outside of this that's as as uh, important as what I will be describing. Okay, so I've you know, last night I actually took like an hour to look at what sort of seminars you've seen so far, and you are all ice sheet experts. It sounds like there you've seen so many seminars that I I kind of uh, took out a few slides of, of background. But overall, I want to make sure we're all on the same page. So. When we look at the ice sheets and their contribution to sea level rise, we are really looking at dynamic system and a balance between what comes in versus what comes out. And so what comes in is snow accumulation. You all know that ice sheets are formed by the slow transformation of snow into ice. And what comes out is basically it can take three different, it, well, ice gets away from the ice sheet through three different processes. The first one is direct surface melt. You see here a picture from Greenland where you have a nice river at the surface. And so that represents about 40% of the mass loss of Greenland. I'm not talking about net loss, but every year, if there is 100% that comes through snow accumulation, 40% leaves the systems through direct surface melt. In Antarctica, it's so cold that there is hardly any melt, maybe a little bit in the peninsula, a little bit on, on ice shelves, but really not a whole lot. The second process is ocean-induced melt. And now again, looking at Antarctica, it's about 50% of the of the uh, the mass loss through we have lots of big ice shelves around uh, Antarctica and there is this warm water uh, well not always but sometimes we have warm water penetrating uh, spilling over the continental shelf from the circumpolar deep water that's warm and um, interacting with ice shelves and overall every year 50% of the mass loss is is through ocean induced melt Greenland is also a big number it's about 30% so these are rough estimates, but to give you an idea of, of where we're at. So 30% of the mass loss is through, we have a few floating ice shelves, especially in the north, and we also have a melt at uh, vertical calving faces uh, that's generating undercutting and leads to more calving, uh, etc. And the last process is iceberg calving. So 50% in Antarctica and 30% of Greenland. So again, these are processes that always happen. They're part of the natural system. What we don't want is when we look at the balance between what comes is versus what comes out. We, we, well, if we want the ice sheets to be in steady state, we don't want the mass loss to exceed the mass gain. Overall, what we're seeing today is we have clearly more surface melt in Greenland. In Antarctica, it's not so clear. And we have a lot more ocean-induced melt and calving and um, grounding land retreating in Antarctica. So the, the mass loss parts, part, part of the system is really uh, picking up. Okay, I'm sure you've seen these, um, these animations before. They're from GRACE. So they're measuring um, local gravity and telling us about where I, the ice sheets are losing mass. And overall, this is, I apologize, this is getting a bit old, it's from 2016, but um, there is GRACE follow on. Uh, I was hoping they would update these animations. They haven't yet. But overall, what we see is both ice sheets are losing mass. We see that Greenland is losing a lot more mass than Antarctica. And we also see that this mass loss is happening primarily around along the coast. So this, uh, if we're interested again in sea level rise, already 52% of current sea level rise is due to increased melting of land-based ice. So a lot of it is coming from mountain glacier, glaciers, but more and more it's Greenland and now Antarctica is, is not negligible. And yeah, as I said, the, uh, most of the mass loss is happening at the periphery, which tends to um, show that ice ocean interactions are happening, are at play. And what you're seeing here is GRACE. And GRACE data is inherently coarse because that's, that's just how, how the, the system works. But there is a lot of spatial and temporal variability. And if we look at a few glaciers, um, this is in, in central West Greenland, the size of these circles here indicate how much retreat these glaciers have been experiencing uh, over the past 50 years. And you see that there is a lot of variability. If we look at another study of the same year, again, the size of the circle tells us the retreat distance. We have, oh, sorry, there is zoom getting in the way. 
we have some glaciers like Hayes Glacier has been retreating by more than 10 kilometers and just next to it, Ilulipsermia has not done anything. And if we look at increase in, in um, ocean temperatures or change in surface mass balance in runoff for these glaciers, there is nothing that really tells us, oh yes, there is an uh, a easy explanation for these glaciers to behave differently. They've been exposed to different forcing. That's not the case. Some of these glaciers are exposed to the same forcings, either from the atmosphere or from the ocean, but still they uh, react completely different, differently to, um, to the same forcings. So no clear correlation with ocean temperature, no clear correlation with surface melt. So if we want to model these systems, and Greenland in particular, which is the, the topic of this talk, we see that we have some work to do in terms of understanding the processes, the stability of these ice, the, uh, these ice streams, and, and how they respond to climate change. So I see that there's some... Uh... All right, so yeah, uh, what I was showing is this graph here, where the circles show the uh, difference in retreat, and you see that it's all over the map along the coast and no clear correlation with the temperature of the ocean, which, which is that, that red um, pattern here or runoff, which is the blue color scale. Really all glaciers are doing different things for uh, different reasons. All right, so if we look at uh, the past IPCC report, there was a, uh, an effort made uh, led by Bob Binchadler. And basically they were like, we need to provide something to IPCC because there is no uh, the dynamics of the ice sheets um, is not accounted for in projections of sea level. So uh, they put together a team of modelers and, and we all run different uh, forcing scenarios for the next 500 years. And what you're seeing here is for one scenario, the ice volume of Greenland. And there's two things that I hope you're seeing here. The first one is that at time zero, which is present day, we're all starting at very, very different volumes. So there, was, there is a, a pretty wild disagreement among models as to what is the current state of the ice sheet. And that's due to different ways of initializing the system. Some people use data simulation and, and, uh, and, and rely on present day geometry, whereas other models like to go through long spin-ups over the past, say, glacial cycle. And so they, when, when they start at present day, they start from whatever the model says they should start with, which may not be consistent with, with the current state of Greenland. And the second thing is what you're seeing here is an extrapolation. The dotted line is an extrapolation of, of current observations. And so this is the current volume of, of green and it's, it's again extrapolated, but it's supposed to go down. And as you can see, most models, including ISSM, which is the model I was, um, I, I've been developing, are projecting an increase in volume, which as you all know, is not possible. So obviously there is something that we're not doing right um, in the models. And that's, uh, that's the picture that we had in 2013. Significant uncertainties remain, particularly related to the magnitude and rate of the ice sheet contribution for the 21st century and beyond. And ice sheet modeling is challenging. I'm not saying that ocean modeling or uh, atmospheric um, circulation is not challenging, but it's ice sheet modeling is still new. We, uh, we've been using some, uh, some form of ice sheet models over the past few decades, you know, to model glacial and interglacial cycles, but to model short-term projections over the next decades or centuries, it's, it's a different focus and we need, we need to understand different processes. There are large scale systems, uh, there are complex interactions with the other components of the earth system, the atmosphere and the ocean, obviously, as I said in the beginning. And there are lots of important processes that we don't understand really well. So the grounding line was a huge problem um, over the past 10, 15 years. And lots of people, including Frank Patin, uh, worked a lot on this to try to help models get better at, at modeling how the grounding line should move. Uh, and the final thing is we don't have a lot of data because the ice sheets are so remote. We have pretty poor temporal coverage. We only have velocities since uh, the 1990s. And these systems are slow to respond to uh, forcing. So with with now 30 years of data, do we have enough to understand how the ice sheets will respond over the next century? And also in terms of spatial, spatial coverage, especially for the bed topography, I'm gonna to talk a bit about this. It's, we don't have a great coverage and bed topography as I'm, I hope I'll convince you is, is key to understand why some of these glaciers are responding differently to the same forces. So uh, we have our work cut out for us. 
now that we know what's happening and that we know that we, if we want to understand sea level and make projections, we, we need models to make projections. And when you talk to people about what modeling is, generally that's what they have in mind. You have your input parameters, you have your initial conditions, your boundary conditions, the model, which is a bunch of lines of code, you turn the crank and you get your model output. And that's you know, the end of the day. But in real life, modeling is more like this, where we have to deal with model physics, what are the physical processes that we want to account for? Do we understand how they should be parameterized? Um, so we have conservation laws, conservation of energy, stress balance, mass balance. What are some of the approximations we can make to make our life easier? And then these are all partial differential equations. So we need to decide how we're gonna discretize them using either finite elements, finite volumes, finite difference, code that into um, some software. And again, we make make, we may uh, make uh, mistakes while we code these things. And then when we look at the model output, 99% of the time, it's in disagreement with, with observations. Just like I showed you with CRIs, it's not going in the right direction. And then the problem becomes, okay, the models are not doing a good job. Where is this coming from? And it could really come from any, any, uh, any part of this diagram. It could come from the model physics that we don't understand well. It could come from our input parameters, maybe we don't know the bed topography uh, really well. Maybe our forcings are wrong. Maybe our initial conditions are not right. It could be a bug in the system. So it's really chasing where, what is the, the, the most significant the, uh, problem in, in, in the models. So here in this talk, I thought I would talk primarily about three of these things that we've made progress on, bed topography, basal friction, and iceberg calving. We haven't solved the questions, but we've made uh, a lot of progress. Yeah, also the stress balance. I'll talk about it for a few minutes. Okay, so this is the um, what I'm going to talk about. The recipe for new generations um, ice sheet models. The the four parts will be determine how ice deforms under stress. We we've known that for so, for some time, but we've made progress in terms of using more complicated physics into large scale systems. Inferring basal conditions using uh, PD constrained optimizations improving the description of the bed topography using mass conservation. And then now once, once we've fixed all of these things, we can try to include, uh, try to work on, on uh, improving the physics of processes such as iceberg having. Okay, so um, this is more of a visual. We, we're not gonna go into the details, but this is the stress balance of ice sheets where you have, um, the divergence of the deviatoric stress, it's incompressible, so the ice is incompressible, so we have to use the divergence of the um, um, deviatoric stress minus the pressure gradient, and then the, uh, the right-hand side, mass times acceleration, is just negligible compared to gravity. And we have incompressibility, which uh, um, is reduced to a velocity that should be divergence-free. So this is, these are the four equations of with four unknowns of full stokes. And in the past, what, what uh, people would use would be the shallow ice approximation. I think uh, Hooter was the first one who came up with the idea. And basically you, um, so I'm going back, all the terms that are here in red would be neglected. And it's very convenient because you end up with a very easy expression for the pressure that could, you can could put back into the X and Y component. And you basically have an analytical solution for your speed. And then you recover vertical velocity through incompressibility. So it's very fast, very quick. But as you can see, you're neglecting a lot of terms that we know are key in many regions, especially around the grounding line. So uh, people have made an effort to try to develop uh, more complicated models. Full Stokes is very expensive. So if you use, if you want to use Full Stokes at the scale of Antarctica, the required resolution uh, is just you cannot run for more than decades or so. Some people are trying to go for a longer time scale, but it's just very, very expensive. And there are in between models. There is uh, the model from Blatter and Petten, where you basically neglect, on, you do the, the uh, no bridging effect, it's called the no bridging effect uh, uh, um, approximation, where basically it helps us derive uh, um, an expression for the vertical stress, sigma zz. And then we neglect the horizontal gradient of vertical velocity compared to the vertical gradients of horizontal velocity. So it's, it, these are not crazy approximations. They're very good approximations. When we compare them to full soaks, we, are, we, we have a fairly good agreement. And the good thing about this is instead of having four equations of four unknowns, 
there is actually a way to rearrange these equations to have two equations with two unknowns. So it's much, much cheaper. It's still 3D though. So the last approximation that uh, people have come up with uh, that was from Doug McKell and Moreland uh, in the 90s, I believe, was to assume that ice behaves as a block, it's plug flow. So now it's, it's easy because it becomes a 2D system, two dimensional system where you only need VX and VY don't, depends on, don't depend on depth. So it's a great approximation for when we have uh, high sliding for floating ice shelves. It may not be so good in the interior where we have more vertical shear, uh, like you see here for where bladder pattern or full slopes may be uh, better approximations. But we've tend to uh, move away from the shallow ice approximation that we know doesn't capture uh, processes such as ice shelf buttressing or other things that are key for uh, explaining what, what's been happening over the past decades. So the other things we've made a lot of progress on were, is to use surface observations to try to help us determine what's happening uh, at the base, boundary conditions for which we have no observations uh, or very, very few observations. It's just very hard to determine what's happening at the base of, of glaciers. So the idea that was introduced by, again, Doug McKell in the 90s was to uh, formulate an inverse problem. So in a direct problem, this is Pine Island Glacier, you give yourself a basal friction coefficient. So here I'm giving myself 30, uh, with, uh, it has some, some complicated units, and then no friction uh, over floating ice. And the model F gives you the velocity as a function of this boundary condition. So that's what we get with the model. But now, we have surface observations. So how, what, what we would like to do is solve the inverse problem where we would like to find the friction coefficient such that our model fits observations at the surface. And life would be too easy if this F minus one existed. So of course it doesn't exist and we must come up with strategies to try to solve, uh, solve this inverse problem. And the idea as in many fields is to basically try to minimize the cost function between VX and VY that are, supposed to, that are constrained by our partial differential equations, our model equations, and we want to minimize the misfit between these modeled speed at the surface and observed speed. And again, with some regularization, there is some, there, there are you know, different ways of doing this. Uh, just wanted to give you an idea of how it works. So we want to, we want to optimize, we want to find alpha, the friction coefficient that is such that we have, um, uh, we minimize our uh, misfit between observations and and data. And so there, there is a way, there are different ways of doing this. Uh, the one that we worked uh, on was to use the adjoint method where you have to solve an adjoint state. And then using this with the Lagrange multipliers, there is a fairly easy way to get the gradient of the cost function with respect to your unknown. And then we can follow some type of gradient descent algorithm. So without going into too much detail, this was our initial state. If we get the first gradient and get some, uh, some minimum, we get here after uh, five iterations, you see that our model is pretty close to our observations. And this is what, what the basal uh, friction coefficient looks like. And after 10, we have an even better fit between model and observations. And I find it pretty fascinating by using that we're using a numerical model and surface observations. And we use this combination of observation and models to determine basal conditions. And what you see again is no surprise we see that we have these tributary glaciers feeding that main ice stream and they coincide with regions of fast flow. And the fast ice stream is in a region that where we have a very low drag coefficient. So no surprise there, but it gives us a fairly easy tool to try to initialize the model in such a way that we have the right fluxes at the right glaciers. So we have the right discharge into the ocean. Now, as I said in the beginning, we haven't solved fully that question. This gives us an initial idea of what the friction coefficient looks like. How does it change over time is, is still an open question. Are we using the, the right friction law is still an open question, but at least we have a way to start with the right fluxes. And we can do that at the scale of Antarctica. This is uh, observed speed from Eric Crenio 2011. It has some gaps and this is the model speed. So again, if you model your glacier uh, with this model, you'll have the right fluxes. So the, the uh, discharge of ice into the ocean will be in the ballpark of what it should be. Um, and you won't start with a bias in the model if you, if you have the right fluxes. Okay. So 
um, it's just giving seminars with Zoom is so hard because I don't, I can't see your face and I don't know if I'm going too fast or too slow, but I'm assuming the pace is okay. Okay, all right. So we've made progress in terms of including better physics into the models, using combining model observations to try to, um, to infer unknown properties, unknown boundary conditions to try to get a nice sheet state that's consistent with observations. And now the other thing we've made a lot of progress on was to improve the, 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 the description of the bed topography under the ice sheets. So I'm gonna spend a bit of time with, uh, with this because bed machine is a project I've been working on uh, over the past uh, more than 10 years now. So we absolutely, just like rivers, we need, or, or the ocean, we need bathymetry. If we don't have the right bathymetry, there is no way we can uh, model uh, these systems and how, how they change over time. And the best way, the most efficient way, is the way to determine the topography under the ice is to use ice penetrating radars. So um, this is the McCord system from University of Kansas. And you mount these um, antennas under an airplane. So this is NASA P3, it was part of um, NASA's Operation Icebridge. And then, uh, so it emits some electromagnetic wave that's going to go through the ice. And then whenever there is a change in, in dielectric properties, you're gonna see a reflection. So here, what you're seeing is the air is kind of a, an X-ray of the ice, a vertical X-ray. You have the top surface. We see that, bl that bright reflection. And here we see uh, the bedrock. And this is actually where we have a grounding line. We have the ocean, we have a few, a few cracks here. Uh, but that's, that's how we get the best way to get ice thickness. Now, as you can see, the problem is we only get line measurements. This is typically, you know, this is typical of an Operation Ice Bridge mission. We have, it, it looks like we have lots of lines, but at the scale of what we need, which is probably below one kilometer of resolution, of horizontal resolution, we're, uh, we have some work to do to fill in the gaps. So the more radar data we have, the better but we need to fill in the gaps between uh, the regions where we um, have data and the regions where we don't have radar data. So what models use um, is the principle of conservation of mass. And basically, if you look at a, a system, it can change, uh, its density can change because of uh, changes in, in, in stress and compressibility. And the compressibility coefficient of ice is very small. It's 10 to the minus 10 uh, per Pascal. And it can also change, the density can also change because of, of thermal expansion. Just like we have thermal expansion of the ocean with climate change, we also have a bit of thermal expansion of the ice, but it's five times uh, 10 to the minus fifth per degrees C. If we look at all of the conditions that ice experiences in Greenland and Antarctica, and we use these uh, two uh, coefficients, the density should vary by less than 0.5%. So saying that the density of ice is, is constant is a good approximation. And so it makes our life easy in a way because this, um, this expression of conservation of mass is reduced to, uh, we have rho here, the density that's constant. So we just have the velocity that should be divergence free. So great. And now what models do, um, if they're not full stokes is we depth integrate this equation between the, the bottom of the ice sheet and the surface of the ice sheet. And what that gives us is the rate of thickness change. So the, the way the ice thickens or thins is dictated by the flux divergence, the surface mass balance that's coming from, for the models is coming from, from uh, regional climate models. And basal melt over granite ice is very small. So overall, we have these, these two terms that dictate what the uh, thinning or thickening rate should be. And again, that's what the model used straight out of the box. So if, if the flux divergence is wrong, our DHDT will be wrong. And so our, our models are gonna start with um, strong biases. So maybe visually uh, that may help. These are three glaciers. It's Upper Navic, South, Central, and North in Western Greenland. And this is our observed surface speed. Oh, I see there is a message. I hope it hasn't frozen or oh, frozen again. Okay, Craig, I think I'm gonna ask you if that's okay with you to share your screen. Um, I don't know why my computer is doing this. I apologize. Right, so what you're seeing here to the left is surface speed. And the model is ice thickness uh, using uh, a method that we used at the time, which is Kriging. And you see to the right, the initial DHDT coming from mostly the flux divergence. And you see it's plus or minus 10 meters per year. If you click one more time, Craig, 
I'm changing the scale to plus or minus 100 meters per year. So if you initialize your model with these two data sets, your instantaneous rate of thickness change will be hundreds of meters per year. And obviously the models are not gonna go in the right direction because they're gonna be uh, basically driven by inconsistencies between these data sets instead of being driven by the four things we're using. So there is a strong need for a more physics-based um, um, interpolation method in between radar lines. The problem here was because the, the was due to the, the Craiging method where we basically interpolate the thickness between uh, data points that we have from radar and it's not doing a great job. As you can see uh, in the middle of the screen, there is like uh, what we call string of beads, bullseyes in this map. And these are artifacts of the mapping technique. And we know we're expecting something that looks more like uh, a network of fjords, continuous fjords that should be deep and remain deep and long. You go to the next slide. Okay, so the idea was to actually, because we know what DHDT looks like from ISAT, from uh, um, Operation Icebridge ATM, from you know different data sets, ISAT 2 now, we can actually try to solve the problem of what the what is the ice thickness such that the flux divergence balances these, these, other, these other terms. And if you go to the next slide, or maybe you can, uh, Request remote control, Craig, do you mind? I think that may be easier. Uh, oh, okay. It's pretty cool, you'll like it. So <laughs> <clears throat> the equation that we now try to solve is the one in the middle where uh, you have uh, the flux divergence that is equal to all this right-hand side that I was talking about. And because this is a transport equation, it's a hyperbolic equation, we need to constrain the ice thickness once for each flow line. And typically what we do is we constrain the ice thickness um, at the inflow boundary, and then we let this, uh, this equation solve for ice thickness for the rest of the domain. And we also want the ice thickness, the model ice thickness, to be as close as possible to uh, observations, to measured radar measured uh, ice thickness. So we have a cost function here at the top that's um, measuring the misfit between measured ice thickness and model ice thickness that is consistent with mass conservation. So if we do this, and hopefully this works. Right, so if we do this, what, what this slide is showing you is the same glacier, uh, the left is before Operation Ice Bridge. So we had no data, basically. It was, it was kind of um, you know, a sad bed, uh, pretty flat. And then after Operation Ice Bridge in the middle using Craigie. So everywhere you have a, a, a black line is where we have data. And what you see is that Kriging was, was basically forcing the bed to go back up in between the lines. And that's because Kriging is as a tropic, I mean, the way it was used there, and it was not doing a good job. If we use mass conservation now, with, which is what bed, bed machine is based on, you now see to the right, this network of three fjords that are long and deep and look, they look like what we expect from a glacial system. And if we look at the misfit between radar data and model uh, for mass conservation and, and Kriging, they're doing about the same, the same job. Yes, we don't fit perfectly the radar data. It's too smooth at times, but overall it's, uh, uh, it's doing a good job. So <clears throat> I, what I've been working on was uh, to use that technique to map the coast of, of Greenland. It's a, it's a method that works really well around the coast because we have fast flow. So the directions of the flux are very well constrained. If the interior, it doesn't work that well. And what you see to the left is basically under each ice stream. So the, the, you have the velocity to the left and the bed topography to the right. And basically under each ice stream, there is a trough. And we kind of knew uh, for most of them that they, they were troughs. Sometimes we didn't know how far they would extend upstream and how deep they were because one of the, the arguments that was made was that if you look at the previous generation of bed topography, very quickly you go above sea level. And so if the ocean is what's driving the mass loss of Greenland, then they're going to retreat for a little bit and then they will not be in contact with the ocean anymore. And looking at this map, we know that it's, it's not going to be the case. So uh, what you're seeing here is in pink, is a continuous connection between the bed topography below sea level and the ocean. And you see that there are glaciers that are going to retreat in neglecting, if we neglect isostatic rebound. These glaciers, we have uh, Humboldt here, Peterman, we have uh, 
Zachariah 79 North. And oh, I don't, I don't know if you see my mouse. And uh, Jakob 7. So all of these glaciers are continuously below sea level all the way to the interior of the ice sheet. So arguments that were made, uh, and Nick, Nick is, a, is a good friend. I, I, you know, I don't want to throw him under the bus, but he wrote that the future mass loss from Greenland will be dictated primarily by declining net surface accumulation because retreat of marine terminating glaciers isolates such margins from ocean-driven melt. And if you, if you use the old generation of bed topography or a coarse model that doesn't capture these fine um, uh, fjords, you will end up with this conclusion, which is probably not true. Uh, so I, I thought I would just talk for two minutes about a cool story. So when I released the, the first version of Bed Machine, I got an email from, from uh, people in, in Denmark and they said, oh, there is a funny uh, shape in Northwest Greenland. We think it could be an impact crater, but we wanted to check with you. And I was like, I, I replied right away and said, you know, it's just an artifact of the mapping method. I'm pretty sure it's not an impact crater, but I'm gonna check. And sure thing, it was actually a real feature. And uh, what they did then was to pretty secretly, like nobody knew about it, they uh, partnered with Avi and with NASA. Oh, let's see if I can go to the next slide. And uh, they sent an airplane over this region and they mapped with a radar and they mapped that potential impact crater to try to see if they could uh, figure out whether the, the shape was right. Well, I don't know if it's, um, it's just so slow. It's okay. Whether the shape of the, the, the bowl was right, whether they could, be, they could see the peaks that are um, in the middle uh, and everything was consistent with an impact crater. So because they used the radar, they could also look at the, uh, the stratigraphy um, of the ice and try to come up with an idea of how old this impact crater could be. And it could be as young as, young as the, the younger dryas. It's still an open question. We still need to do a lot more work. But it's funny that this map that was designed to, um, to improve projections of sea level ended up um, you know, helping make that discovery of, of an impact crater in Northwest Greenland. Okay, so a few years later, um, several people told me, why don't you do this for Antarctica? And I was like, sure, why not? But it ended up being way more complicated than Greenland. Just, well, for one reason is Green, uh, Greenland is so much smaller. It's seven times smaller than, than Antarctica. The other reason is in Greenland, most of the uh, ice thickness data had been collected by NASA, uh, a few from, from uh, Germany, from, from Denmark, but overall, most of it was openly accessible, easy format. For Antarctica, it's a lot, a completely different stories. You see here all the different missions that I uh, have managed to get data from, different countries, different formats, uh, different uncertainty. It's been, it's been quite a, an interesting project to, uh, to do. And on the left, you see uh, the bed topography from bed machine. So even though I say bed machine, it's, not, it's, it's never over. We always get more data. There are always regions where, um, you know, there are things that can be improved. And so it's, it's, it's called bed machine because it's always improving as time goes. So it gets better. So that's just one example. Uh, the, the gold standard at the time was Bedmap 2, which was a huge improvement over Bedmap because we had so much more data. Um, and this is Malak Glacier. And what you can see here is because there was no data close to uh, the, the grounding line, the, the bed was pretty flat. If we lose, use mass conservation, because we know that all of this mass has to make its way through that narrow fjord, it has to be deep. And we see also lots of details like this ridge here upstream. I don't know if you can see my mouse again, but kind of in the middle of the image, uh, that may be a very a stabilizing feature, feature for the grounding line if the grounding line starts to retreat. We know that big ridges like this can act as anchor points for the grounding line. Oh, you can see my mouse, awesome. They can act as anchor point. And maybe uh, this system that maybe would have been vulnerable using Bedmap 2, may not be as vulnerable with bed machines because we have these features that are captured. Another thing that we discovered was, was uh, Denman Glacier. So it's a glacier in here in, in East Antarctica. And let's keep going then. So with bed machine, we found a bed that was 
about three kilometers below sea level. And I was a bit nervous about it because it's, it's very deep. It's the deepest point under the ice sheet that we've, we've ever found. And the problem is because we don't have a lot of data um, over the ice stream, it's hard to know whether it's properly constrained and whether the, the depth that we came up with is, um, is accurate or not. So if we look at two cross sections, we have uh, B1, B2, that's across the glacier. You have the surface, that's that black line here. And you have bed map two, that's the green line. And bed machine is the, is the, uh, the blue line. You see it's below 3000 meters below sea level. And a long flow, uh, you see that it's more than 2000 meters below sea level. And again, it's very important for models to have these depths because they control the flux. It's not just the, the, the velocity that needs to be captured. It's both the velocity and the ice thickness because that's, that's what dictates uh, the amount of ice that goes into the ocean. And so I was a bit nervous. And what, made, what came up uh, as a relief was that um, a colleague, uh, um, Virginia Brancato, working with, with Eric Quino, well, it's not submitted, it's accepted now, looked at grounding lines. Even though they couldn't see, we couldn't see the bed in the region of the grounding line, we can see what the grounding line is doing in, uh, over time. And what you see here is grounding lines at different times. And you see that the pattern of retreat is very consistent with the shape of the bed that was inferred here. And again, the last constraint was probably 80 kilometers upstream. But still, if the depth may not be quite right, the shape, uh, the shape is consistent with, with the topography. And again, here we had sort of a ridge in the bed topography that coincide with a region where the grounding line has not been doing a whole lot. And again, that's expected from ridges and bumps to be regions where, uh, where the, the grounding line tends to be stable. Okay, so I was gonna talk a bit about calving, but for the sake of time, uh, I wonder whether I should talk about next steps. Oh, we'll see, let's see how it goes. How much time, uh, Craig, should, we, should I leave for questions? Um... I, I suppose one of the convenient things about these online talks is that if somebody needs to leave, they can sort of leave. And, and sort yeah, that's true. Working, so um, so uh, uh, I don't know. I think we normally have something like 10, 15 minutes at the end, but uh, I wouldn't worry too much. So sure, we'll see. Uh, yeah, I don't want to go too much. I know everybody is busy. Uh, I don't want to rush it either. So we'll see how it goes. Okay, so um, what has happened in Greenland is mostly this positive feedback where you have this warmer currents, it's Irminger currents now getting into the fjords, melting, uh, melting um, the calving phase, especially we have undercutting going on, going on with more subglacial discharge. And that triggers an initial ice front retreat. If you retreat the ice front, all of the friction that was going on in this region close to the terminus or along the sidewalls is gone. So we, we lose some of that resistance and the glaciers accelerate because they accelerate, they thin, because they thin, they're more prone to further retreats. And so we have, we have this mechanism that's at play. And obviously, if we want to model the next decades or centuries, we need to capture this. Otherwise, uh, the models are not going to be able to make a good, to do a good job at, at uh, uh, I hate to say predicting, but projecting the future. So there were lots of calving laws out there, and I tried them, and none of them really gave good results. The, the, the ice fronts were either advancing all the time or the pattern of retreat was wrong. So I, I, I tried to develop uh, with my colleagues a new calving law that was based on tensile stress. And what you see here is it's, it's the bed topography. We have the ice to the right, we have the ocean to the left, but I just peeled off the ice. And you have ice front positions, observed ice front positions over the, uh, since two, between 2007 and 2017. And that's what the model predicts. Using one, there is one parameter to calibrate, which is basically a threshold that's around one megapascals. And you see that, yes, it, it's not perfect, but we get the right rate of retreat and it's retreating where we expect it to retreat. So again, not perfect as any models, but once we have this, once we have an okay bed topography, we have initialized the model with, uh, to have basal conditions and we have, we capture the past, uh, the past 10, 20 years of retreat, we can, run the model for, uh, further um, in time. And this is what, what the model would do. It would be stable for some time. You have one line per year. It would be stable for some time here because if you look at the bed, it's a region where we have this bump. It's not very pronounced, but it's there. But once the ice front goes past that bump in this over deepening, we know it's unstable. And so the ice front is gonna jump from bump to bump. 
uh, and, and starts to retreat. Uh, did I go too fast? Sorry. So we've, we've done this for all around Greenland um, and came up with, with new projections. The other cool thing about models is that we can play with it and see what happens if we increase the temperature of the ocean by one degree, by two degrees, by th three degrees. And this is what we did for this glacier, uh, that's Zachariah uh, in Northeast in Greenland. And basically we see it's, it's falling apart right now. The ice shelf is falling apart. And the model predicted that it would be very stable on that ridge here in the bed. And we try to push the ocean warming to see what we needed for the ice foam to continue to retreat. And I think it's something like two and a half degrees. So it's, it's a lot of warming that we would need. But if that happens, the ice foam will start to retreat from that uh, branch here. And then it goes um, in the interior of the ice sheet and you have some ice piracy going on. This ice stream that was feeding 79 North is now um, redirecting. So lots of interesting things going on. But we can try to play with different scenarios and see, see what happens. So that's what we did for, uh, well, it's, it's the work of my, my PhD student, Youngmin Choi. Uh, we worked on all of these basins around Greenland. And the goal was to capture the speed, to capture the rate of retreat, the thinning rates by, um, you know, we're not tweaking the model. We're just changing initial conditions potentially. And then we let it go and we want the model to do a good job. And what you're seeing here is anomalies, for example, for uh, this sector, for North Greenland, uh, what you see um, in, um, <clears throat> in the, the dotted yellow line is the anomaly in ice discharge and the dotted red line is the anomaly in surface mass balance. And the overall mass balance is the blue line. And the observed change from 2010 to 2020 is in black. And so you see that we're, we, we have a good trend. The model is going in the right direction, which was not the case before. We're starting from an about right initial state and the right direction. There are regions where it's not, it's not doing such a good job, like Southeast Greenland. And it's a region where we know the bed topography is, is not quite right yet. Uh, we have some more work to do. But overall, we are in better shape. We, we're now able, combining all of these pieces together, to, uh, to have a model that's going in the right direction. So I wanted to talk a, for just a few minutes about what I see as being next steps um, and some of these has been, you know, uh, coming from discussions with colleagues uh, that are probably in the room. So I don't want to say these are my ideas. Uh, they're ideas from, from, from the field. So the first thing is coupling to global climate models. And it's really a two-way coupling, even though so far we're mostly looking at ice sheets from a standalone perspective. We say, this is what the ocean is doing. This is what the atmosphere is doing. Down the line, if we look at longer time scales, the albedo of the earth is going to change if the ice sheet starts to retreat. There is ocean atmospheric currents that may be affected by the discharge of fresh water from the ice sheets. There may be effects on biogeochemistry that people are already working on. So lots of feedbacks that would be interesting and need to be accounted for in, in a two-way coupling. So uh, there are many efforts um, on the way. There is, I think, Bill Lipscomb is, is around, so he's working on on CSM and trying to have CISM coupled with, uh, with the other um, um, components of the climate model. E3SM, Model E, I'm sure all of them are trying to get a dynamic model in there. And so with ISSM, we've, we've also been trying to couple to uh, climate models, the MIT GCM, uh, with CSM. And anyway, if, if this is something you would be interested in, I'm more than happy to, uh, to work with you on integrating ISSM. So we were hoping it would be uh, included in the next IPCC report, but I think it's going to wait uh, one more round. The other thing that I see as uh, a future step is this was kind of the past, and this is now. We have lots of instruments in space. We have lots of data, maybe more than we can ingest. So we need to have to develop ways either using machine learning or using uh, different ways of, of doing data simulation to try to take the maximum, uh, make the most of these data that we've never had before. We went from no data or one map every five years to almost too much data. Oh, it's never too much data, but it's right now we don't have the tools to make full use of it. And one thing that I've been working on is uh, to use data simulation using automatic differentiation. Basically what happens is we want now our model, 
we want to optimize not a static model and do your present day velocities this fit this present day velocities. We want the model to fit the data as they are collected over um, you know, 20 years. So that instead of constraining the model once, we constrain it through its trajectory. And this is a work that uh, several people have been doing. Dan Goldberg is probably one of the experts uh, doing this. And so you see that you have a very complicated cost function that with different sensors, different types of data. We want to fit VX and VY, but also surface height, maybe temperature in boreholes, uh, maybe, I don't know, there may be other, other things. And automatic differentiation is a tool that we can use to derive automatically without having to code the adjoint state to get the gradient of our cost function with respect to what we don't know. And so we would be able to, uh, to improve the state, uh, to, uh, to better constrain the models and get even more accurate projections. Okay, so um, it's almost uh, nine, nine my time, 12. I'm sure everybody's hungry. Uh, but overall, uh, ice behaves as a non-Newtonian fluid, as you know, and it's really a balance between mass gain and mass loss. Mass gain, I didn't talk too much about it. I think you're going to have some talks about it in Greenland is really going down. We have more and more melt in Antarctica, not a whole lot of change so far. Mass loss, surface melt, ocean-induced melt, calving, and ocean-induced melt is probably the one that we, we the community as a whole has been working on uh, because it's, it's what needs to be captured and understood in order to make projections. So numerical models, they help us uh, understand current changes and make predictions. And what we see is warmer ocean currents is oftentimes the triggering mechanism. It's that initial retreat. And then what happens is the bumps in the bed or the, the topography in general controls the rate of retreat and how far the ice sheets, uh, the, the glaciers have to retreat until it finds a new stable position. So the new generation of ice sheet models, I, I talk mostly about ISSM, but it's true for, for uh, many other models. They've made critical advances over the past few years. So to answer the question, how, are we able to predict how fast the ice sheets are going to melt? We do a much, much better job every year, better job than uh, the year before, but I, I would say we're close. So we're getting there, but there's still some things we need to better understand because before we can say this is a good prediction. The uncertainty is still pretty high. Okay, that's all I had. I'm happy to take questions. Thank you very much, Matthias. Yes, that was fascinating talk. Thank you. Thank you very much, yes. Yeah, no worries. Uh, Thank you, guys. I hope people don't mind us uh, running over here. And, and thanks, Matthias, for sticking with us throughout the crazy month. Uh, do we have any questions from, from, the, uh, from the group? Can you direct the, the the new radar surveys to just to go in your particular critical areas for your bed map machine? Yeah, it's an it's a great point and great idea, and we've we've been trying to do this uh, because there are some regions where we know if we have one more data point, it will make it will reduce the uncertainty a lot. So uh, I've been in touch with Operation Icebridge uh, to try to do this, and also there are some things that uh, when you do flight planning, you may not think about, but basically mapping flying across a glacier has a much, uh, is actually much better in terms of uh, uh, in terms of predicting the flux. It's constraining the entire flux of the system. Whereas in the past, people tend to flow along flow lines. So it's great, you get a great bed topography along the flow line, but it doesn't constrain anything along the sides. So flow lines is, flow line mapping is great, but we need more cross section mapping. And so that went into the, the planning of, uh, of flights for Operation Icebridge. Unfortunately, Icebridge is kind of almost over now. So we're hoping there will be more missions to try to further improve the bed topography. Uh, but yes, yes, uh, we, can, we, uh, we should use bed machine as a way to determine where we should collect more data. I, I see, I think Frank, Frank has put his hand up. Um, would you like yeah, to Mathieu, questions? thank you very much for this uh, very neat talk. Um, oh, so you focused a lot on the, on the ice sheet models and the pre improvements of the ice sheet models, but mm -hmm. uh, what is your opinion on the uncertainties coming from the forcing and the climate models uh, with respect on improving the uh, uh, projections of future uh, mass change? Yeah, it's an excellent point, as always. I think uh, if you look at RACMO and MAR, there 
way far ahead of us in terms of how how good their output is and how how much how good the agreement uh, between their models and observation has been over the past 10, 20 years. So uh, this, well, okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna say for Greenland, I think in terms of surface forcing, I'm I'm optimistic that yes, it's not perfect and there is a lot of uncertainty, but most of the uncertainty is still lying within the ice models and these parameterizations that we don't know. Uh, the question mark for me is East Antarctica, because we see that models, uh, surface mass balance models, especially, um, it varies widely. And there are models that predict a lot more snowfall in East Antarctica that may balance, counterbalance the, the, the mass loss from, um, from, the, from, from the ice streams accelerating. There are some other models that don't show a whole lot of, of increase in surface mass balance. So I think for Antarctica, they, especially East Antarctica, they still have a long way to go, uh, probably as long as, as ours. For the ocean, it's a different question. It's extremely difficult to model uh, these narrow fjords in Greenland or the circulation of ocean under the ice sheets because you need such a high resolution. And at the same time, these systems are forced by boundary conditions, you know, uh, at the, the shelf break or, or, you know, pretty far. We, we're doing what we can. And as part of ISMIP-6, uh, a lot of people worked on trying to get the best forcings that they could. But uh, yeah, we, we're not there yet. I agree. It's, uh, I haven't talked too much about the forcings, but ocean has a long way to go. Oh, we've got a question from Vivian. Um, okay, do the new bed machine data indicate that glaciers extend much farther inland than previously thought? Thought As a consequence, while further warming, would there be a greater potential for greater retreats and ice loss than previously? Yes, yes, uh, yes, that's the point that I, I tried to make. That with previous beds, the, the models would retreat and then reach higher ground above sea level, and they will not be in contact with the ocean, so stop retreating. But with we have some glaciers that are sitting on a bed below sea level for hundreds of kilometers. And so this retreat triggered by the ocean is gonna go on and on. So I'm, I'm taking a shortcut here because the warm water is actually at depth, is you know, below 200, 300 meters. And if, if there are bumps that could block that warm water from interacting with the glaciers, uh, that could slow down the retreat. But overall, they're gonna be in contact with the oceans um, in the foreseeable future. So if you were to put, integrate everything that you've told us and, or when you get asked by, you know, some sort of popular science communication desk, what is your best guess like for a hundred years from now? And can we rule out like the, you know, the sudden Antarctic collapse or can, are we really only going to be that, you know, one and a half meter range a hundred years from now, or do we really not have a way to constrain that? Like what's the integrated sum? Yeah, that's, that's a, Good point. So what I've shown doesn't include processes that are currently hot topics like the marine ice cliff instability. Uh, some of these processes that may be happening, but for which we don't have observations to constrain these processes well. So what I've been showing, I would say, are mostly conservative estimates. And we cannot rule out multi-meter sea level rise by 2300. Um, I think this is still on the table. And even if it's a conservative estimate, I think it's much more mass loss that, than the previous generation of conservative estimates that did not include ice phone retreat or things like that. We're going in, the direction we're going is more, uh, more mass loss, even with conservative estimates. But yes, there may be processes at play that we don't, hydrofracture, collapse of ice shelves. Uh, these things may happen and they're not accounted for in what I showed. We, we have another question in the chat from uh, Lawrence. Uh, Laurie, okay. Does the ice velocity direction vary enough with depth to matter when converting uh, surface ice velocity to depth? Uh -huh, this is a very good question, Laurie. So um, if we look at uh, the theory, if, it's, if there is no sliding, uh, it can vary by up to, I think it's 7%. So it's not a whole lot. The difference between basal velocity and surface velocity is, is it can be 100%. But depth average versus surface is actually not so much. But the regions where we apply mass conservation and, and do this approximation that you're talking about, which is depth 
uh, depth average velocity is equal to surface velocity, we apply this method in regions of fast flow where we know there is sliding going on. So it's, it's a good approximation. I've been trying in the past to um, use a model to try to determine what the uh, correction factor should be. And overall, you know, it, it, the, the bed map ends up being more or less the same. So I kind of gave up on the idea. Uh, I think for the interior, we'll, we're going to need something else. Um, what I'm working on right now, if you're interested, is, is, is using machine learning uh, to try to identify basal fe features based on surface features. I think this could help us for the interior more. And we can constrain the system with, with a, a loss function that could be inspired by mass conservation. So anyway, I hope this answers your question. Thank you. Do, do we have any uh, final questions from the group? It was a really nice talk. Thanks very much. Thank you, Anagra. When you have the bumps in your fjord that might stop it, do, is the bedrock different there? Is this some kind of a different composition of the, this, or is this debris left from the previous uh, uh, retreat, say uh, the Indian retreat? Are these bumps removable, you think, or are they gonna be there for a long time? Oh, while the rates of erosions up, even though they're high, if you look at the, the, the world of erosion, it's, I think off the top of my head, I'm, th I'm thinking centimeters per year. So they're gonna be there for, you know, for the human time scale. Yeah. Uh, are they coming? I don't know for sure where they're coming from. And it probably depends glacier by glacier. They could be old yeah. moraines. Uh, they could be, uh, it's, it could be a different type of rock that's just more, more, uh, solid than the surrounding rock um i i don't know but what i can say is yes over the if we're interested in 100 200 300 years they're good they will be there should there ever be a drilling campaign to see what one looks like oh drilling campaigns are always great we learn always a lot about the ice uh, structure the type of bedrock yeah we we coring the bedrock uh is actually extremely useful because we learn about when this region was, uh, you know, not covered with ice, the type of bedrock, we can learn about uh, basal properties. So yes, yes, any campaign, you can count me in. Even though I'm a modeler, we, we need more data to improve our understanding of all of this. Yeah, so Julie has the same question, interplay between friction coefficient and bottom topography. They, they're, Yes, uh, the roughness uh, of the bed, the, the, whether it's sediments versus crystalline rock, all of this gets into that friction coefficient that we invert for, and we assume that it's, it's okay and it's not gonna change with time, um, but who knows? Do we have any uh, final questions from the group? We should probably uh, close up at some point, although this is uh, great. Looked like Vivian had something in the chat. Oh, sorry. Ah. Are there any scenarios where retreat of the tidewater glacier would proceed to such an extent that it may connect with the subsea level? Uh, so the the one of that I showed for Zachariah was doing this, but we reach a point where we don't know if we have the physics right. You know, you end up with very tall cliffs. Uh, and what's happening to all of these, these icebergs, they're probably gonna stay around and maybe exert some stress on, on the cliffs. It's, I, I'm tempted to take this with these, these uh, scenarios with a grain of salt, but it's depending on the forcing you use, it, it may happen. If you, again, forcing of like a three degree increase in ocean temperature or something like this. So is this dynamic environment uh, can you drill without shearing of the drills? Uh, uh, I guess it depends on how, how fast your drill is. Um, and you can also go on the side of the ice stream. You don't necessarily need to go straight in the middle. I don't know. I'm not an expert in drilling. Okay, do, we, do we have any final questions? We should probably uh, say goodbye at some point. Um,
All right. Well, thanks everyone for uh, coming. Thank you very much, Matthew. Thank it's you. Everything. Thank you very much. All right, and see you, you know, in person at some point. H U maybe. Yeah. Thanks everyone. All right, bye. Again, amazing day. talk. Thank you. Thanks.